Hello lovely people. Welcome to a new historical profile with a twist because I'm dressed like a Greek goddess. Historical profiles are a series on my channel where I look at the life of a disabled or LGBTQ plus person from history and we chat about what they went through. Sometimes we talk about how they were surprisingly not a great person like Helen Keller or I learn about how their gayness was erased from the history books like Emily Dickinson. But today we're just sitting and chatting and gossiping. And honestly, I'm exhausted, so hey, let's just chill together. If you're interested in fun, educational, relaxing content, sometimes following my life, sometimes more structured stuff like this, but generally around the themes of LGBTQ plus chronic illness or disability with a touch of vintage flair thrown in, then subscribe now. You can click the link in the top left-hand corner of the screen to watch past profiles. I, the update though, for anyone who isn't aware, I've had a baby and I'm tired. And yes, for other people, you may notice I'm dressed a little differently to my normal style. For those of you who are new here, just just nod along. And for those of you who, much like my neighbour, can't tell the difference between eras of vintage clothing and think my being dressed in an 18th century formal gown is the same as my normal 1950s inspired day wear and have to spend a really awkward three minutes in silence every time you see me evaluating whether or not I'm in costume and whether you say something about it, I feel really sorry for what I put you through but no, no, this is actually meant to be a costume. I'm dressed as the person Philodemus of Gadara called the 10th Muse. Oh yes. It's Sappho. There'd probably be less chest, but I was in a rush and ASOS didn't have that. But I've decided to start spicing up my historical profiles by adding some costume touches from the era, whilst I gossip about people because why not? Especially when it comes to the original lesbian, which should definitely be the title of this video. The original lesbian. Speaking of costumes, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you have definitely seen me talking about June's journey before. But whether you've never heard about it, or you've been a June's Journey player for a long time, like me, this update has something for you. Prepare yourself. Memoirs, the new gameplay edition that consists of collecting snippets to complete pictures within an album, but oh, 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 <clears throat> each album is only available for a limited time. Okay, so June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game with beautifully crafted scenes, all inspired from the 1920s era. I'm, I'm really quite into this game, can you tell? So, to celebrate the new update and its strong female-led narrative, June's Journey invited me to a very special photo shoot with the amazing Linda Blacker. My channel member had early access to some of this footage but I just had to share it with you because oh my goddess do I love to dress up. June's Journey roster of female characters are a source of inspiration. A strong, caring, ambitious women who stand up for important values such as diversity, individualism, equality, fairness and empathy. I embodied Virginia Van Bruen, June's niece. She's this cheerful girl who's enthusiastic and she's determined to help her Aunt June in her cases. So click the link in the description to download June's Journey for free and collect all of those snippets. It's available for iOS and Android. I have also left a link for the trailer for the new update in the description because if I haven't tempted you to download it yet, I bet the trailer will. Now, back to our saffing queen. So, right, obviously, I had to go right back and start with the original lesbian. How many times can I say original lesbian? Sappho, the queen of the lesbians. Or was she? But you know, according to her Wikipedia, maybe? After all, it doesn't even get gay until three paragraphs in. Yet, the words sapphic and lesbian originate from her name and home island of Lesbos. Fun fact, in 2008, two women and one man from the island of Lesbos attempted to sue the homosexual and lesbian community of Greece in an attempt to stop them from using the term lesbian and thus set a precedent to stop the rest of the world's woman-loving women from using that term, claiming that only people who were actually from the island of Lesbos were allowed to call themselves lesbians. It didn't work out. Sappho lived in a time before Buddha was even born, before philosophy was a word, and before same-sex attraction was even considered negative. As such, her identity and her desires, despite being written so plainly in her poems, and they really, really were, have been debated for thousands of years down through the ages. Homophobia existed before it was named as a concept, but her poetic legacy was so great that talk of her has prevailed throughout the millennia. And that's why she is the icon, because despite some people's best efforts to erase her utter gayness, it's just not happening. 
P.S. If you've enjoyed this video, you should definitely go and check out Eleanor Medhurst's post depicting Sefo, the original lesbian look, because 10 out of 10. Eleanor does great works over on Dressing Dykes where she looks at the historical lesbian costumes because she is a lesbian fashion historian and that is a niche that honestly ticks my boxes. But hang on, hang on. For those who are new to the group and haven't had the rainbow download yet. Because yes, we've been lying to the world all along. LGBTQ plus people do get a download of queer info into their brains when they come out. It just takes a little longer for some. Don't worry if you haven't got it yet. And yes, we do all know each other. Who was Sappho? Her name is apparently a corruption of the ancient Greek word for sapphire. So hey, people giving their children unique names has apparently been happening since the dawn of time. Born in Eresus, maybe, in about the year 617 BCE, or possibly 20 years before that, or after that, or 7, or 13, so vaguely 2,650 years ago. Sappho lived in the island of Lesbos, an island in the eastern Aegean, situated so close to the mainland of Asia Minor that it's possible to see across to what is now Turkey. She was of noble birth, and her father was called, bear with me, Scamandronius, Mus, or Scamander, or Simon, or Eumenus, or Eregius, or Eucritus, or Samus, or Cayman, or Eterechus. Mm. And this level of pronunciation is after a classic A level, so really it's no wonder I butcher every name in my other videos. This is according to the Sudda, which is an incredibly thorough, but not, as you might have gathered, very reliable Byzantine encyclopedia from the 10th century. Her mother was named Cleus, and Sappho later had a daughter of the same name, although the word which she uses to address the girl in a poem can also mean slave, so maybe she didn't have a daughter, she just had a slave. Unclear. We do know that she had two brothers named Caraxus and Lorichus, and she wrote a poem about them that was recently discovered. Because, cool, we're still finding things. The world is amazing. You can still be an adventurer, kids. Don't give up on your dreams. Though we have little of her work left, she once had nine volumes of poetry, all of which were well loved and referenced by other famous writers. Plato even said, Some say the muses are nine. How careless. Look, there's Sappho too from Lesbos the Tenth. In around 590 BCE, she founded the Women's Circle in Myrtleen, which may have been a cultish community set up to honour Aphrodite. This was either a harem of fellow women who bore an erotic attachment to each other, or a marriage preparation school for daughters of noble birth. No one really knows for sure because the history is confusing. <laughs> Nowhere does Sappho refer to her husband. She mentions various women she had relationships with and names them, in fact. Anactoria, Athis, Gongula, her friends Mika, Telesippa, Anagora, and two people she had falling outs with, Gorgo and Anadromeda. That's a name I actually know. During her lifetime, Greece was much more accepting of same gender attraction than it is today. And thus, Sappho, if her poems are to be believed, lived her life quite openly. Indeed, her notoriety for loving women and the island she spent most of her life on led to the creation of the word lesbian. Now, initially the word did describe fellatio between a man and a woman. However, her reputation shifted it to the way we use the term today which is really quite a shift for a reputation to make. Sappho had such an impact on our language that her very name gives off the word sapphic, describing a romantic love between two women. But even the earliest historical sources that acknowledge rumours of Sappho's homosexuality then quickly oh, dismiss them as slanderous. A biography of hers from the Hellenistic period, which is around 323 to 330 BC, BCE, oh god, it's so confusing that we do that now. Hang on. So we used to say BC, but now we say BCE, and we used to say AD, but now we say CE, because it's no longer Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. It is CE, current era, because that was before Christ. It's now BCE, which is before current era. And I really should get with this, because they changed it after I was at school. I just want to think the same things as my kids. <laughs> Anyway, biography states that she had been accused by a few of being undisciplined and sexually involved with women, which, true. Of course, we then come across the narrator historical loophole in which homophobic historians claim that her poetry was not, in fact, autobiographical. Oh, 
you know, I mean, they can perfectly accept the poem to speak personal truth when discussing other things like politics or a musical preference, but sexual attraction to a woman? <gasps> Why? She must be ghostwriting a poem from the point of view of a man. Mm, 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 mm. But really, do we care? Do we care? Do we care? I'm not a fig. But once the gays have claimed you as our own, we're keeping you. Case in point, Sappho and Arena in a garden at Mertlein, painted in 1864 by Simeon Solomon. For, you see, Sappho's status as a lesbian icon prevails. Here she sits, a crown of laurels in her hair, the symbol of triumph, kissing Arena, who, okay, let's be honest, doesn't look like she's the most thrilling human to engage in conversation, but perhaps that's just the unfortunate turned on face. To Sappho's other side, a propped scroll and a lyre, symbolising her poetry, for it is often to be spoken lyrically with musical accompaniment. The women are entwined, and so there can be no room for confusion. No, they were roommates. The lovebirds above them mirror their kiss. I'm feeling like it was a bit harsh in arena now. Maybe she's just really deep. The painter is pre-Raphaelite affiliate Simeon Solomon, a gay man who routinely painted same-sex images of desire, both male and female, and was arrested twice for sodomy, which uh, then ended his career after public scandal. A large sum of the iconography we have of Sappho is actually from this era, with its kind of distinct modern twist on the ancient Greeks. Oh, you know, it's a lot of pre-Raphaelite fabrics and hair and, ah, oh, but uh, it's a lot less gay. This painting, Sappho and Alcaeus, I'm sorry, I'm butchering all the pronunciations, we're gonna have to roll with it, by Lawrence Alma Tadema from 1881, shows Sappho with Alcaeus, another poet from a time period, in a male-female romance. I mean, they're also just sort of staring at each other, but apparently this is a romance where two women kissing was, who knows, maybe. Oh, welcome to Jessica's I Have a Newborn, I Have Chronic Fatigue, and today I'm salty about art show. Sappho and Alcaeus did actually interact at some point. Historians have evidence of that, but absolutely nothing inferring a romantic relationship. This is the end of the movie, right, where our two leads, one male and one female, just randomly kiss, completely out of the blue, despite zero chemistry throughout this entire movie for no reason other than the studio execs worry that she seems just a little bit too capable. And the men in the audience just wouldn't find her attractive. In fact, in ancient scholarship, Sappho was portrayed as a really promiscuous heterosexual woman, so people would enjoy her poetry, I guess. Remember how I said her poems mentioned many, many female loves by name, but not a single male or a husband? Well, historians gave her one anyway. <laughs> Yay. But since her supposed husband was Kirkules from the island of Andros, which actually translates to penis from the island of men, they may have just been trolling. Another supposed lover was Phaon. I'm pronouncing that wrong. A fairy man blessed with good looks by the goddess Aphrodite. Mm. As you may have gathered, he wasn't real, which kind of scuffed the relationship. Both her mythical lover and her husband were first written about centuries after her death, but Sappho herself only spoke of women. Although in terms of first person evidence, all we have to go on at this point are 600 lines of poetry, the majority of which were translated by someone else at some point. We actually don't know how Sappho's verses sounded in Aeolic the most archaic and tricky of the extinct ancient Greek dialect, in which the initial aspiration was omitted from words. I don't even know how you do that. I am not good at this. I score in the under one percentile for phonological awareness. Oh, I, I know that because I, I had to get tested. <laughs> Dyslexia. Granted, this leaves a little room for interpretation, but not to the point of creating a husband for her whose name is literally penis. And just because a man and a woman are in a room together at one point doesn't mean she can't be a lesbian. So just calm down, Victorian historians. Poet Willis Barnstone writes of these theories, it is no less than astonishing how otherwise temperate scholars become outraged and imaginatively unobjective at the slightest suggestion by others of moral frivolity on Sappho's part. Not that being a lesbian is like that frivolous, to be honest. I'm a lesbian and sometimes we just eat toast. Regardless of the theories that desperately try to link Sappho to any male around, she's a recognised part of queer culture, one that the community has refused to let fade away. Sappho's lesbian icon status took off in the 1890s, along with her words lesbian, sapphist and sapphic. I feel like we don't use sapphist enough. That feels like a really excellent sexual identity to align with, though SGBTQ plus doesn't have quite the same ring. 
By the turn of the 20th century, the Sappho look was clear, as shown in John William Goodard's painting, Reverie in the Days of Sappho. The woman in the painting isn't strictly meant to be Sappho per se, but golly has she got the look. Ancient Greek woman in toga that could slip off if needs be. Hair that says, I am intelligent and think deeply about philosophy, and my hair just threw itself into this complex style. Lounging on a marble bench, framed by nature, with nothing better to do than talk to you and fall in love with you. Mind, body, spirit. She probably knows everything about your star sign and the colour code and whatever other personality quiz lesbians are into that century. We don't know for sure what the real Sappho actually looked like, however, as many of her contemporaries described her in such vastly different ways. Prim and pure, shameless and corrupt, a gallant teacher, love-crazed muse, beautiful and supremely ugly. Her countryman and contemporary, Alcius, the one she wasn't in a relationship with despite having maybe been in a room with at some point, remember him, described her as violet-haired, pure, honey-smiling. So yes, people who complain about anime, purple hair was a thing in 600 BCE. Socrates called her beautiful. Plato said she was wise. Strabo described her face as a marvellous phenomenon. And Horace noted she was masculine. But there's now actually no way of knowing what he meant by that. Masculine and face, demeanour, having a harem of women. You're going to need to expand on your judgy comments, Horace. Don't just stop there. Ah, I kid. Horace is actually totally forgiven because he wrote in his odes that Sappho's work is worthy of sacred admiration. She is not someone who can fade away. Her work is known as some of the best poetry of all time, full of wit and eloquence and inspiring other writers for thousands of years to come. So yeah, he's, he's forgiven. We, we allow him. At one time, statues of Sappho were common, and even today she can still be found on coins with her laurel-crowned profile. A papyrus from the late 2nd or early 3rd centuries, for its part, claims that Sappho was ugly, being dark in complexion and very small stature, contemptible and a woman lover. I mean, but bar the last part, that seems to contradict every other description of her, but who knows, because earlier on a man who actually met her said she had purple hair, so who knows? That's the joy of history when it's this far back in time. We can really mould it into whatever we choose and make of it what we will. I told you Sappho's renaissance was at the turn of the 20th century, but it was also in Paris. The French capital was at that time the go-to destination for modernist lesbians, like LA is now, if the L word is still to be believed. Their community became known as Paris Lesbos, and their leader was Natalie Barney, who is fascinating in her own right. A writer, poet, and proud lesbian who was, as you may have already guessed from the time period and her being able to live openly, stonkingly rich and an orphan. When Natalie inherited everything at the age of 26, she bought a house in the outskirts of Paris, which then became the centre of the Paris Lesbos. For over 60 years, she hosted a weekly literary salon, a gathering at which people met to socialise and discuss literature, art, music, and any other topic of interest. She heavily promoted female writers and artists, particularly those who were interested in other women, and shared her fangirl-esque love of Sappho. Yeah, no, she, she really, really was into Sappho. Indeed, at one point, she got in trouble with the neighbours for hosting an outdoor performance of a play about Sappho that... It, that it was felt followed nature too closely. Yes, close in this photo. At one point, in a bid to revive a struggling relationship, she even travelled with her love to the island of Lesbos. They were slightly disappointed to find that the island wasn't actually covered in lesbians, but happy enough to begin discussions about starting a school of poetry for women, much like the one which Sappho, according to tradition, had founded on Lesbos some 2,500 years before. But then, her lover Vivian got a letter from her other lover, Baroness Helen von Zuren, and went to Constantinople Antinople thinking she was going to break up with her in person, but she didn't. She stayed with the Baroness instead. <gasps> so I guess it is a bit like the O-word, really. Lesbians and drama. Sappho can probably relate. Sappho meant a lot to these women. She was evidence to them. They could hold her up and say, look, other women have felt the way we do. We're just following the natural time-honored tradition of women like us. In one salon in Natalie's garden, the dancer Matahari rode naked except for a crown into the garden on a white horse with a bejeweled harness. And she wonders why the neighbours complained. So Sappho's image was fully claimed by lesbian culture and it continued to be so. We can see her look popping up over and over again to say our history is important and we've always been here. This photo is from the Equal Rights Amendment March in Washington DC in 1978. And there's our Sappho proudly standing in the crowd to let us know that lesbians have been here all along and we're always going to be hot. 
So I thought it was definitely time to pop Sappho into my historical profile series since she's where my section of the LGBTQ plus rainbow umbrella started and it seems a little strange not to have her, right? It's also really interesting just to chat about the erasure of her identity as a queer woman. With historical figures who are in the not so distant past, I always feel we have to be a little more careful and we can't really prescribe labels to them or decide their identity when we're using terms that they would never have heard or concepts that they didn't necessarily have access to. It just seems unfair somehow. But also, representation is important. And why is the default heterosexuality? Hands up who wants to rage with me about compulsory heterosexuality. You know what? Sappho is important because she's a huge part of the legacy of queer history and it's important that isn't erased. Homophobic erasure of our history can come in many forms. It can be overt, like the mob of Christian zealots who partially destroyed the Library of Alexandra in 391 BC, which housed nine volumes of Sappho's poetry at the time. Or Pope Gregory VII, who ordered her works burnt in around 1073. Or it could be much much smaller, like minimizing her attraction and love for women in favor of praising her inventions of poetic convention. Nevertheless, many scholars, historians, and artists through the centuries have risked their own reputations to tell the truth about Sappho. If they hadn't, there would be nothing left of her memory. Sappho has become as much a figurehead as she was a poet, proof that homosexuality is as old as legends themselves. I feel like an oracle right now. Might be the chronic exhaustion. Can't confirm. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Subscribe if you haven't already and I shall see you next time. Mwah.